We'll start now and I will go on this lecture in, uh, on cavity quantum electrodynamics. So I remind you that the last time I started this series of three lectures, which are devoted with my own uh, scientific career. I am describing experiments that we have been performing with atoms and photons trapped in a high Q cavity. Last week, I described the conditions under which this kind of experiment would be made. I said that, I explained that we need to create a situation where an atom can emit, a, an atom in vacuum can emit a photon and then reabsorb the photon and undergo a cycle of absorption and re-emission in a time shorter than the time it takes for the photon to disappear in the cavity due to the cavity damping. So we need to have extremely good cavities. And uh, I describe situations where uh, the atom can oscillate many times before the, pho the photon can be absorbed and emitted in vacuum many times before the cavity is damped. I also described uh, this oscillation uh, in a coherent field. And I explained that because the number of photons in a current field is not fixed, the radiociation occurs at different frequencies which beat with each other. And this leads to the collapse and revival of these oscillations, collapse and revivals, which are a sign, a signature of the quantum nature of the electromagnetic field. So I will go on today uh, in these experiments, describing these experiments and I will, let me make sure that it works. Apparently. Okay. Uh, so I called, I can define this experiment by saying that what we are studying is how we can juggle with atoms and photons in a box. So you see here this kind of artistic picture, which was uh, made by one of my colleagues. Uh, he holds, these mirrors, these are niobium mirrors on which the photons can bounce many, many times. And so we juggle with atoms and photons in this surrounding. The outline of the lecture will be as follows. I will start by connecting these experiments to uh, the thought experiments that I described at the beginning of the lectures. I will show you that what we are doing in the lab are actual realizations of the thought experiment that Einstein and Bohr discuss. So we demonstrate entanglement, we demonstrate quantum superposition, we demonstrate complementarity with these experiments. I will start by describing resonant experiments, experiments in which the atom and the, and the field have exactly the same frequency. And this will lead to the discussion of atom photon and atom atom entanglement and the possible realization of atom photon quantum gates. Then I will shift to non-resonant experiments, experiments in which there is a small detuning between the atom and the cavity. In this case, photons, the number of photons cannot change because it does not conserve energy. But what the photons do is that they shift the energy levels. So we, we exploit light shifts, but light shifts in the quantum regime, light shifts in which the change of photon number by one, two, three units has an important effect on the system. And I will uh, describe an experiment showing that you can count the photons without destroying them because it's non resonant in a, what is known as a quantum demolition photon counting. And we can observe quantum jumps of the electromagnetic field, which are the counterpart of the quantum jumps, atomic quantum jumps, jumps that I discussed earlier. In the last part, I will talk about uh, how you can observe this uh, cavity QED light shifts by microwave spectroscopy of the atomic system. And uh, I will show you that this amounts to perform a deterministic projection of a coherent state on a photon number state. The coherent state has an uncertainty in the photon number. When you perform these experiments, you force the photon number to converge to a given value which of course change randomly from uh, one shot of the experiment to the next. And this also illustrates 
the postulates of quantum physics. So uh, the principle of the experiment was already discussed. We have two mirrors facing each other and photons are bouncing from one mirror to the other many, many times. And we study what happens when there is one atom inside this cavity. And we observe the interaction of one atom with one or a few photons. And this is, of course, the most fundamental process of light matter coupling, because we take the smallest element of matter, which is an atom, and the smallest element of light, which is a single quantum of light, a photon. We test fundamental quantum laws. And as you will see, we can demonstrate elementary steps of quantum information processing. So this system is not is a system of basic research. There is no technology directly involved, but these kind of experiments are now being translated in more applied domains in the system called circuit QED, which obeys the same laws as, as cavity QED. And next week in the last lecture, I will say a few words about the possible application of these uh, procedures for uh, quantum information. I want to start by emphasizing the, the big difference uh, of between the experiment I will be describing you today and usual photo detection. Usual photo detection is based on the photoelectric effect, which Einstein discovered in 1905, and which I discussed in one of the lectures. In the simplest form, you have an atom on which a photon impinges. The photon is absorbed and ejects one electron, which goes into uh, a continuum of states, and the, the electron is detected. So in fact, the photoelectric effect destroys the photon. The photon is annihilated in the process, an electron is produced, and the electron is detected. And this is the signature that a photon had been involved. So this is how photoelectric effect works in general. And a similar process occurs uh, for ordinary vision. A photon gets into your eye. It, on the retina, it interacts with the uh, uh, set, the cells of the retina, and you have a chemical process and electrochemical process which occurs. But the basic point is that the photon is destroyed, and you get a signal to the brain. So this is a destructive procedure. You can see. Most all the information we get from the universe, most of it comes from photons, but the photons die when they deliver the message. When you have an image forming on your retina, the photons are continuously being destroyed and you get this information this way. So the question I am asking is, is it the only way you can detect a photon? Is it possible to detect photons without destroying them? It is to to have a system, to have a measuring device which tells you there is a photon here, and then it can be remeasured and remeasured, and the photon is still there. And this is what is called quantum non demolition. And according to the laws of quantum physics, this process is possible. And of course, an ideal measurement process does not destroy what it is measuring. In fact, one of the postulates of a quantum measurement is that after the measurement, you get into an eigenstate of the measurement that is a given photon number and the system has to stay in the same eigenstate. The photon are not destroyed. So usual photo detection is not an ideal process. So what we try to demonstrate now is a process which is uh, more fundamental than the photoelectric effect because it does not destroy the quantity it is supposed to measure. Uh, this is a problem which was dealt with by in some of the thought experiment by Einstein and Bohr. I remind you that I discussed at length the famous photon box experiment. The photon box experiment, which was an experiment designed to uh, illustrate the Heisenberg and Satellite relations between time and energy. The idea was to measure the number of photons in a box, the energy in the box, by weighing the box in the gravitational field of the Earth. And this was, this relied, was a thought experiment, of course, which relied on the fact that there's an equivalence between energy and mass and an equivalence between uh, inertial and gravitational mass. And they discuss that in details. This experiment did not destroy the photons. The photons were escaping at some point from the box, but you could measure the number of photons before and after without destroying them. So there is some relationship between what we are trying to do. Of course, in our case, uh, gravity does not play any role. So uh, I remind you, 
the way our experiment work, we have two mirrors which are kept at a very low temperature with superconducting uh, coating and atoms interact one by one in this box. They cross the box either horizontally if they fly at a thermal velocity or vertically if they fly in, a, in an atomic fountain. The important point, of course, is the quality of the cavity. The photons can bounce a huge number of times between the mirrors and they stay trapped in this cavity for in the best cavities for more than one tenth of a second. The, and if you assume that the photon is a particle bouncing between the mirrors, it bounces over a total distance of the other 40,000 kilometers. So if you unfold the trajectory of your photon, you can go around the Earth. And uh, you know that there are a lot of photons which go around the Earth in optical fibers. The big difference is that in the optical fiber, the photons are attenuated over a few kilometers, a few tens of kilometers at most, and you need repeaters. Here, the photon can travel over this distance over one tenth of a second without any repeater. It's just a natural decay due to the imperfection of the mirrors. And uh, to symbolize the experiment, you see what happens. The atoms are prepared in Rydberg states one by one. They cross the cavity, and after they have crossed the cavity, they are destroyed because they are detected. So the atoms are destroyed, but not the photons. So what is the connection? We can try to make a kind of connection with the uh, uh, thought experiment of Einstein and, and Bohr. So you see here the photon box on the, on the left and the, our cavity on the right. The, of course, the cavity is a photon box. It's mirrors which, can, which keep the photon trapped. And you see that in the Einstein Bohr experiment, a very important element was the clock. It was a clock which was triggering the opening and the close of a shutter. And here, as I will show you in a moment, we have a clock. The atom which goes across the cavity is an atomic clock. And in fact, it's a, the, system, the measuring device uh, is based on the Ramsey interferometer, which is exactly the same kind of interferometer you have in cesium clocks, for instance, and it works in the microwave domain exactly like the cesium clock. So there is a, 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 an analogy between these two experiments. You have two kinds of experiments that I would describe. First, resonant ones. Atoms emit and absorb photons coherently in the box. And then non-resonant experiments in which you slightly detune the cavity from the atoms and you work with light shifts. And in order to tune the cavity and the atom in resonance, you can do two things. Either you can slightly move the mirrors, which change the frequency of the, of, of the field, or you keep the cavity fixed and you tune the atomic transition by applying an electric field across the mirror. You have an effect called the Stark effect, and the frequency of the atoms is slightly changed. And this is much more convenient because you can apply an electric field in a very short time. It's much more flexible than a mechanical motion of the mirrors. So that's the way we process. So uh, what we observe and I described already last time is the vacuum rabiociation. If you start from the atom in the upper level of the, of the transition, and if the atom is, tight, is strictly resonant with the cavity, what it can do is emit a photon, reabsorb it, and re-emit it. And this is the first signals we obtained already 25 years ago. Uh, they are damped, and you see only a few oscillations because the system was not as good as the one we have now. But the important point is that you get this oscillation. Uh, some things that I did not discuss yet is how, how do you, how you uh, record this kind of uh, signal. What you do is that you choose a given interaction time, and then you average, you send atoms one by one, you send hundreds of atoms, and you measure the probability for the atom to exit in E or in G. And this average gives you one point. Then you change the interaction time, you get another point, and then you, you, you record this signal. How do you change the interaction time? There are two ways you can do it. You can change the velocity of the atoms. I told you that by the Doppler effect, you can choose atoms which are a well-defined velocity. And so they will cross in a well-defined time the cavity. But there is a, another procedure which is more convenient, which is to apply, again, a Stark effect on the cavity mirrors at a given time. You just let the atom interact for some time with the cavity. And then suddenly, 
you switch the frequency of the atom far away from the cavity, so it freezes the evolution. The atom gets out of the cavity with this, with the motion, with the state it has reached at the time when you switched off the interaction, and then you detect it. And this way, you can sweep the interaction time continuously, and you get this kind of curve. So, what are the kind of vacuum rabbit pulses that you can do? First thing you can do is to stop midway between E and G. This is called a pi over two pulse. And in this case, it's a vacuum pulse. It's a pulse which is induced by the vacuum field in the cavity. And when you do that, what you see is that you are midway. You start from E, the atom in E with zero photon, and you end up with a superposition of E zero and G one. So this is a state which I uh, just let me try to take. You see, this is written here, you get E0 plus G1. This is an entangled state. It means that when the atom <coughs> leaves the cavity, it, left, it leaves behind either zero or one photon. If you have zero photon, the atom exits in level E. And if you have one photon, the atom is in level G. And the distance between the cavity field and the atoms is a macroscopic distance, several centimeters. So you get an entanglement between the, the cavity and the atom. And we see this is a kind of experiment which leads to the Schrodinger cat experiment. A single atom is entangled with a field. In this case, it's a vacuum, but we see we can entangle with a field which contains many photons. And then you get in a situation which looks more like a Schrodinger cat. Now, what happens if you wait twi twice as long? If you wait twice as long, it's a pi pulse. And you see when you get at this point, E0 has become G1. So what it means is that if you stop here, the atom leaves exactly one photon in the cavity. And this is a state which is quite different from a classical state. A classical state has a, a fluctuation of the photon number. Here, if you do that, you really prepare a quantum state, something, a field which is a, an eigenstate of the photon number, one photon. And in the end, I will show you that you can use techniques to prepare not only one, but two, three, four, any photon number that you want up to a certain value. So this is also interesting. Uh, what happens now if you go to the two pi pulse, then you are back here. So the two pi pulse, you make it just one complete turn and you go from E0 back to E0. Or if you start from G1, G1 back to G1. So you think that you have not done anything, but in fact, you did something because I don't know why you have this stuff here. doesn't want to go away, but you see here, you have a phase change. You go from E0 to minus E0, you go to G1 to minus G1. This is because your system is, is a spin. And when you make a two pi rotation on a spin, you come back to the same state but with a phase shift. If you want to find the same state, you have to make a four pi rotation and not a two pi rotation. This two pi rotation, which phase shifts the quantum state is useful in quantum information as we will see in a moment. So what happens here? I describe again the radio oscillation. You start from the atom in the excited state with zero photon. After a pi pulse, you get the atom in the lower state and one photon. After a two pi pulse, you are back in the excited state with a phase shift. So this is the OC and it, it goes forever in principle if you don't have a relaxation. So what you prepare depending upon the time you spend is linear superposition of E0 and G1. And if the atom emerges from the cavity when these two amplitudes are equal, you get a maximally entangled state. So this is the first process. Now, how can you use that if you want to entangle two atoms? So this is what I, why I call that uh, uh, quantum knitting, rabbi knitting. You, you knit, you, you prepare more and more complex entangled states. Here we stop to two atoms, but you can extend to three atoms and so on. So what happens with two atoms? So you have atom, the two atoms, the first atom cross the cavity and it goes a pi over two pulse, like I just described before. So you transform E0 into E0 plus G1, and the second atom is still, has not crossed, it's still in G. 
So I call it G2. So the first process entangles the atom to the field. Then I send the second atom, and for the second atom, I perform a pi pulse. That, that is a pulse which is twice as long. And you see what happens if you if G encounters zero photon, it stays in G because G zero is not connected to anything. But if G encounters one photon, G goes to E and the number of photons goes to zero and you get the two atoms entangled. The two atoms have been entangled without interacting directly. They are entangled because they interacted in between with the photon field. And in the end, the photon field comes back to vacuum. That is, you still, you, you don't have entanglement between the atoms and the field. The entanglement, which was between atom and field has been translated into an atom and atom entanglement. And the field has played the role of a catalyst. It comes back to the same initial state and can be used again for other experiments. How do you do that? You apply an electric field to the mirrors in order to freeze the evolution of the pi over two pulse for the first atom and the pi pulse for the second atom. So you can play with electronics to do that. And in this way, uh, you entangle the two atoms. I, I want to point out that this is quite analogous to the entanglement between ions that you can perform in ion traps. In the case of ion traps, you use sideband laser excitation in order to excite a common vibration mode. And in the end, the vibration mode comes back to the ground state and the two ions are entangled. Here you do the same, but it's not what is, what is uh, uh, transporting the entanglement is not uh, a vibration mode, but it's a photon. But it obeys exactly the same equation because you know that uh, a mode of a mechanical oscillator has the same dynamical equation that the mode of the electromagnetic field. So this is entangling two atoms by resonant exchange. Now, uh, I want to discuss uh, the, first, the experiments that we have been performing uh, many, many times and which have, found, which have proved to be very flexible. It's a Ramsey interferometer. And I remind you how it works. Here you have the box in which we prepare the circular states one by one and we control the state which we prepare its velocity and the atoms are going one by one across the system. And when they get here, an electric field pulse is detecting them in a selective, in a uh, state selective way. And we get one bit of information per atom. The atom is either in E or in G. So you could call the state zero and one. Each atom gives you in the end one bit of information. In between what happens, the atom crosses the cavity, of course, and some dynamical effects occur in the cavity, either resonant or non-resonant. But before entering the cavity and after leaving the cavity, you can apply a classical microwave pulse, which will prepare the atom in quantum state superposition and then analyze other quantum state superposition at the exit. And I described in detail this kind of experiment. This is called the Ramsey interferometer. The first pulse prepares a superposition of atomic states and the second pulse analyzes this superposition. And you have a phase delay, a controllable phase delay between these two pulses. Uh, one way to, to change the phase is just to change the common frequency. If you scan the frequency of the source which feeds the two uh, zones, you have a delay because when, when the atom goes from one cavity to the other, from R1 to R2, the field has evolved by a quantity which depends upon the frequency. So if you change the frequency, this amounts to changing the phase of your Ramsey interferometer. And you observe, of course, fringes, which I discussed uh, in detail before. So you have. Can yes? Yeah, in fact, you, yes, you are right here in this zone, the field that you apply on the atoms is a classical field. It's, it's made by a huge number of photons. So it can be described just as a classical rotation. It, will not create the uh, it creates the coherence because it creates a superposition of the two states and then you analyze it, but it's a classical uh, procedure, exactly like the one I discussed in the lecture when I talked about magnetic resonance. So there is a big difference between the pulses here, which company, these cavities are bad cavities. The, the number of photons is not, is continuously renewed. It's completely different from the cavities that you have here. 
So this is just a classical interferometer device. And so uh, what the information we will get will depend upon, of course, what happens here. So the phase of the atomic fringes and the amplitude depends upon the state of the field in C, and uh, which affects in different ways the probability amplitude for the atom to be in level E or in G. So it will phase shift the fringes. I will come back to this just on the next slide. So this is a very simple experiment that we did, which exploited the two pi phase shift that I discussed before. We do exactly, we do the following experiment. We have now three, we, three relevant Rydberg state, E and G, which are the state I have always discussed, N equal 50 and equal 51. And the cavity is exactly resident between these two states. And then you have a third auxiliary state I, which is just the quantum state 49. So I, I exaggerated the difference. In fact, the, this frequency is rather close to this one, but dif very dif different, much more different than the width of, of our microwave feeds. And this is a transition on which you apply the Ramsey interferometer fields R1 and R2. So you do Ramsey interferometry between these states, and one of the states involved is involved in the uh, coherent evolution with the cavity field which is resonant with uh, the transition 5051. So, and what we do is that we choose the interaction, the interaction time in the cavity in order to perform a two pi, exactly a two pi pulse here. So at first sight, you can think that uh, the cavity doesn't do anything. The cavity, if the, the atom is in level uh, E with one photon, it goes, to G0 and then back to E1 photon and nothing has happened. But there is a phase shift. And you see what this phase shift will do. Suppose that you have one photon in the cavity. I1 does not change because the level I is not concerned. But G1 becomes minus G1. So you have the EI pi phase shift here. On the other hand, if you have zero photon in the cavity, I0 does not change anything. And G0 does not change anything because the ground state is not affected. So you get I plus G zero. And so you see in the end what happens if you have one photon in the cavity, I plus G has become I minus G. And if you have zero photon in the cavity, I plus G has stayed I plus G. So you see that what you have here is a pi phase shift, which is conditioned to the presence of one photon in the cavity. The GI fringes are inverted when photon number in cavity increases from zero to one. And we have observed that, and I show you that on this slide. What you see here is what happens if an atom in level G enters in an empty cavity. The atom, you look at the fringes, and if you sit here at the top of the fringe, it means that the atoms go get out in the same level you are here. But what happens now if you have one photon in the cavity? Then the shift, the fringes are shifted by exactly one half fringe interval. So it means that if under the same condition, you just have changed the photon number from zero to one, the atom entering in G goes out in I. And so you see now that with the proper phase choice, you have in fact a quantum gate. If you have zero photon, the atom stays in the same state. If you have one photon, the atom change state. And the field in the cavity is a control qubit has not changed. The photon has not been absorbed. The photon has just produced a phase shift of the atomic state. So this is also, you can also see that as a first kind of quantum non-demolition experiment, because this, a way, this is a way to measuring one photon without absorbing it. And in order to, this is what I have shown you here is just theory, but now we show you the experiment, the way we did the experiment. What we did is the following, we played the following trick. We, we first send an atom in level E, and with this atom in level E, we make a pi over two pulse, which means that with a probability one half, one photon will be emitted, and with probability one half, zero photon will be emitted. So this is a way to prepare in the cavity either one or zero photon in a random way. You, when you detect the first atom with a probability one half, you will find one photon. With a probability one half, you will find zero photon. 
But then you send the second atom, and the second atom undergoes a two pi pulse. And what you, what you record are the fringes, but you condition your detection to the state in which you detected the first atom. So what you see in blue are the fringes you get if you select the source atom getting out in level E. And in red, you get the fringes that you detect if you condition your free second atom to the detection of the first atom in level G. And so you see that you, you build these fringes randomly, but in the end, you find fringes which are phase opposite, which really means that your interferometer is able to uh, select one and zero photon in a way which is quite clear. If you tune your interferometer to look at this phase, clearly you have a large probability to detect the atom, to detect uh, zero photon and one photon, uh, uh, depending upon whether the first atom has or not deposited the photon in the cavity. So what I want also to say that again, of course, this is a, this is a quantum gate. The, the first uh, photon is de deciding what will be the state of the atom. And if you prepare the, the first uh, photon, if you, the first atom is in a superposition of zero and one of E and G, that is the photon will be in a superposition of zero and one. And this is that you will, this means that you will entangle the, the control with the target in the end. And so you see that this kind of system performs entanglement. So I, I won't detail that more, but you, you can see all this is discussed in these papers. What I want to say also is that this is restricted to zero or one photon only. You cannot, you cannot add a second photon because if you, if you add another photon, then the evolution will be faster by factor square root of two, and you will lose the simplicity of the system. You will have to take into account the possibility to have two photons, three photons, and so on. And uh, this is something which will complicate the situation. Now I will go to another kind of experiment in which the atom and the photon field are non-resonant. And you will see that in this case, you can perform this experiment with more than one photon and they stay much simpler. So let's go to, to this situation. But before that, I have to uh, make a little bit of theory. I have to recall, to recall you uh, the uh, diagram which represents the energy of the coupled atom field system. And I will describe it first at resonance, which I already did last week. And then I will go off resonance and we'll see what are the differences. Mm -hmm. So I remind you what we have, uh, what we are coupling is a two level system here, E and G, and it's a harmonic oscillator. And I consider the situation where there can be a small detuning between uh, the atomic qubit and the field oscillator. This detuning is of the order of omega, which is the Rabi coupling between the system. It's a little bigger, and we see that it plays a very important role. Here in the middle of the slide, I represent the two systems together. And again, this is something that we already uh, discussed last week. The ground state is non-degenerate as G0, the atom in the lower state, the field in the lower state. So this state is uncoupled to anything. And then you have doublets. G1 is resonant or nearly resonant with E0. G2 is nearly resonant with E1 and Gn uh, plus one is nearly resonant with En. And this, and when you, when you describe the Hamiltonian which couples these two systems, uh, you see that the coupling intervenes only within each of these doublets because these, are, these levels are nearly degenerate and the interaction between these states dominates uh, greatly all the other processes. And I represent here what happens in the doublet E n plus one uh, between E n plus one and uh, G n. You see here the level E n when you increase, what happens when you increase the detuning? As, at zero detuning, you are here. And if you plot as a function of the detuning, and if you don't take the coupling into, into uh, 
effect, En is just this straight line, and Gn plus one is this straight line. It's going down because what I what I show you here is what happens, for instance, if you apply a magnetic field which leaves a, which by Zeeman effect moves the level. So you En is going up, Gn plus one is going down, and they cross exactly at resonance. When when you are here, G with N plus one photon has exactly the energy of E with N photons. But now, because of the coupling, these two states repel each other, and you get what is known as anti crossing. And this splitting here is proportional, it's just omega square root of N plus one. And when you diagonalize the, the, the Hamiltonian in each of these manifold here, you get energy levels which are given it's just a solution of a second order equation just it's a second order equation for the eigenstate and you get this solution which gives you the two branches of a hyperbola and this hyperbola has as asymptotes the unperturbed levels and so you get exactly the energy levels by this formula this is what the energy exactly at resonance and plus this are the two branches of the hyperbola which uh, give you exactly plus or minus omega square root of n plus one if you are at resonance and uh, which give you uh, delta square root of delta square plus this if you go away from resonance so this is a very simple just diagonalization of a two by two matrix which give you this result and uh, you see what it gives what it the result here if you look at the combine the states of taking the coupling into account G0 is just single ground state. In the first excited set, you get a doublet plus or minus with zero. Then you get a doublet here with splitting omega square root of two. Then another doublet here with omega square root of three and then omega square root of n plus one. And the eigenstate of uh, the Hamiltonian are just the eigenstate corresponding to these eigenvalues. And they are linear combination of the EN and GN state, which I show you here, plus or minus N are just at resonance EN plus or minus I GN plus one, just a linear combination of the unperturbed states. And from this expression, you can find the radiociation again. If you start from EN, EN is a linear combination of the two eigenstates plus or minus N. And so you have a linear combination which evolves according to this function cosine omega square root of n plus one t e n plus sine omega square root of n plus one t g n plus one. This is a radiociation. So at resonance, you just retrieve the radiociation, which occurs at a rate omega square root of n plus one. And, and this leads also to the quantum collapse and revival. So for here, I just recall what I discussed last week. But now I would like to focus on what happens if you go away from resonance, that is, instead of being with delta equals zero, you go, let's say here, and look here, I have tried to expand to enlarge this part of the diagram. You see that the, the energy level, when you take the coupling into account, is displaced with respect to the asymptote. And this is a small shift. It is a light shift. This describes the energy shift produced off resonance by the coupling between the atom and the field. And this is exactly the light shifts that I have been discussing in previous lectures. The same light shift as the one which allow you to trap atoms in, in uh, gradients of electromagnetic field. Uh, the light shift which are huge in laser trapping of atoms. And here they are very small because we have only one, two or three photons. Here they are in the range of kilohertz, whereas in the light trapping atoms are in the range of gigahertz or so tens of gigahertz so it's a very small shift but the important point is that this shift is proportional to the photon number and why it is proportional to the photon number what you have to do is just to this is the exact expression but you have now to take an approximation when delta is large so you can expand you can get delta out of this uh, square root and you get one plus omega square over delta square and you expand this as a power of omega over delta. And what you get is what I show you here. Uh, you see that the shift is given by this expression, omega square over delta. And this is exactly the same kind of expression we had for light shift before, but now it's proportional to the light intensity that is to n plus one. 
and you see that the light shift increases linearly with the photon number. So you have the quantity, physical quantity, which is proportional to the photon number. And since the photon number is discrete, the light shifts are discrete too. And we will see that this is very important for the experiment that we are doing. You see also that if you go down to zero photon, delta, you have no light shift for G0 because G0 is not affected, but E0 is affected by the light shift. And so you see that if you look at the transition between G0 and E0, which is just the atomic transition in the, in the vacuum, you find a shift, and this is a lamp shift. This is a lamp shift, which is induced by the vacuum in the cavity. So you have a shift for the vacuum, and you have a shift also for all the other transitions. And I show you here, uh, you see the expansion giving you uh, the energy shift when you have n photon in the cavity, and you find that this shift is proportional to n. It's omega square over two delta. Why? Because the upper state is shifted by omega square over four delta in one direction. The lower state is shifted by minus omega square over four delta in the oppos opposite direction. So it gives you a shift of omega square over two delta. And this shift is the quantity which would be useful uh, in the following. Uh, this shift, if, if the atom stays in the cavity during time t, this shift gives rise to a phase shift of the atomic coherence, which is omega square over two delta time t. And so this is a quantity which I call phi zero, which is the phase shift per photon. The phase shift which the atomic coherence requires per photon. And we will see that this phase shift per photon can reach the value pi and can be even much larger than pi if the atoms are slow enough. And this is a kind of pi phase shift per photon, which is very useful for the experiments that, that I will be describing now. So what is the principle of this dispersive photon counting with the Ramsey interferometer? Now the cavity is non-resonant, so the photon number cannot change. If the atom enters in the cavity in level E, it is the energy of the atom is shifted in one direction by a quantity proportional to the photon number. And if the atom enters in the cavity in level G, it is shifted in the opposite direction by a quantity proportional to the photon number. If you prepare the atom in a superposition of E and G, you have now a coherence, an atomic coherence, which evolves, uh, acquires a phase which depends upon the photon number. And you analyze this phase with a second Ramsey uh, field here, and then you detect the atom and find it either in E or in G. So that's the idea, and you see, uh, summarize that here. What does the first, what does this Ramsey pulse do? It transforms E into a superposition of E and G. And you see what, remember now what is the level E? Level E is a kind of wave, the boy wave, which oscillates n plus one time, n plus one time here. And the level G is the same, the similar the boy waves, which oscillates one time less. And when you superpose the two, you get a matter wave interference. On one side of the orbit, the, the two waves are at maximum. And since you have one node more in one than in the other, it's clear that on the other side, you will have a negative interference. So if you look now, you see that you have now prepared a kind of wave packet, which is concentrated on one side of the orbit. And of course it rotates, it rotates at 50 gigahertz, which is a Bohr frequency between the two states. So you see that in a very simple way, you can understand that a pulse of light, pi over two pulse of light, prepares a transverse dipole, which rotates in the plane perpendicular to the z-axis. And so, and this is like, you can look at this dipole as a kind of uh, uh, hand, the handle of a clock. And you just have to count the number of revolution, and this is a principle of an atomic clock, in fact. So what you have is an atomic clock which is perturbed by the light shift effect, which occurs inside the cavity between the two, the two Ramsey zones. So let's look again here and let's concentrate on, on, on what happens. You see that the phase shift is proportional 
to the number of photons. Phi naught is a phase sheet per photon. And if you look at orders of magnitude, phi naught is omega squared over two delta times the interaction time. And with the uh, orders of magnitude I gave you, omega naught over two pi is 50 kilohertz. If delta is equal to two omega naught, and this interaction time is varying between uh, 50 and 500 microseconds, you see that pi can take the value from pi to 10 pi. You can have, you can have a phase shift per photon, which is very large. So let's focus on the case where the phase shift per photon is equal to pi. It means that if you have zero photon in the cavity with a convenient setting, the dipole will get out in, this, in one direction. And if you have one photon, it will get out in the opposite direction. So you see that by measuring the phase of the atomic dipole, you will know whether you have zero or one photon. And there are experiments in which it is enough to know that. For instance, if you have very low temperature, the Planck's law tell us that at 50 gigahertz at the temperature of our experiment, which is less than one Kelvin, at 95% probability you have zero photon, 5% probability you have one photon, and the probability to have more than one photon is completely negligible. So you see in this case, if you have very low temperature, a single atom gives you one bit of information which is enough to decide whether you have zero or one photon in the cavity. And this happens without destroying the photon. So this is the first experiment we did as soon as we got uh, this good cavity. And I summarize this here again. I think now that you start to have a good idea of that. Prepare the atoms one by one here. They cross the device, you detect them here. They undergo the phase shift in the cavity here and pi over two pulse prepare the superposition here and detect it here. And this device is an atomic clock. And you see that, in fact, if you look at orders of magnitude, uh, the, 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 the presence of a single photon inside makes a shift of a 10 minus 7, few kilohertz out of uh, 50 gigahertz. 10 minus 7 means that if you wanted to use this as a clock, a single photon will delay the clock by about one second per month. One second per month is not much, but for an atomic clock, it's a lot. If you have a good atomic clock, it can do that very easily. And our clock is good enough to see this effect, that is to detect the effect of a single photon in much less than a month, in, in, in a few minutes. So what you do is, you see the Ramsey fringes that you get if there is zero photon in the cavity. Then these are the Ramsey fringes you get with one photon. And you see that if you tune your system here, you will, the, the atom will exit in one state if there is one photon in the cavity and the other state if there is zero photon. And this is exactly what we do. And in fact, we proposed this experiment back in the 1990s and it took us 15 years to get it working because the we needed the technology, the cavity good enough, this uh, super cavity that we have been using uh, since 2006 to do that. So it took us a lot of time, but we analyzed this, the system in details. And you see here the result. If you have one photon, you get the red fringes. And if you have zero photon, you get the blue fringes. In fact, if you, want, if you have more photons, what we do here, of course, is that what we measure is the parity of the photon number because one, three, five, seven photons give you the same fringes and zero, two, four photons give you the same fringes. So if you, if you perform an experiment with a pi phase shift per photon, what you are really measuring is the parity of the photon number, which amounts to the photon number if the temperature is very low. And you see, these are the first signals that we get. You see a blue bar means that the atom is exiting in one state in the, east, in the G state, and the red bar means that the atom is exiting in the E state. You have some noise, that is, but you, you see here that the majority of atoms for a long time are getting an G, which means that the cavity is empty. And then suddenly you see the appearance of one photon. This photon lasts a very short time, stays a very short time in the cavity, then it decays due to relaxation, due to imperfection in the cavity. You are back in vacuum. And here, of course, I choose one of the most striking signals. Here you see 
a single photon which has stayed for half a second in the cavity, then it has disappeared and then another photon and so on. So what you immediately see in these traces, this is very really quantum signal, you see first that the method is non-demolition because hundreds of atoms agree to see one photon or not. And you see also that it's random. The, the rate at which, the, the moment at which a photon disappears appears cannot be predicted. It's just a random process. The only thing which can be predicted are statistics. Since we, are, we, we, we can apply Planck's law, if you analyze a huge, long series of signals like that, you find indeed that the system is excited only 5% of the time. And from that, you infer that you are at a given temperature. And from the length, the duration of these steps, you find that what is the lifetime of one photon in the cavity, and you find that it's the lifetime of the cavity, which is 130 uh, milliseconds. So we got a lot of interesting results from that. These are, for the time being, these are thermal photons. In fact, nature gives us this natural source of photons just to, to see that this works. So I think this is a good point to stop. I just want to stress the last point is that this is again a quantum logical gate now, which is based on dispersive non resonant effects, but it's the same kind of gate as before. Uh, the photon is not destroyed, but it's just helps it just uh, decides what the atom has to do either being in one state or in the other. Okay, so we'll stop here and in the second part of the talk, I will start by discussing how you can count more than one photon. And I think this is very interesting because you will see for the first time, uh, the projection postulate of quantum mechanics at work. How do you acquire information about a quantum system when you measure it continuously? So we stop until five and then I will start the second part of the talk. Thank you.